Hey guys, do you want to hear the latest hot scoops from PAX? Well, too bad, because I spent the whole weekend at Dragon Con, and Dragon Con is the party con. I can barely remember what happened after 10 p.m., but it sure wasn't a professional developers conference or a gaudy press show. In fact, it's more about TV and comics than anything else. And costumes. That's always been a big deal here. But thanks to the efforts of former Epic president Michael Caps and his wife Julian Caps, Dragon Con now has a video gaming track. And this year is the second year in a row in which Dragon Con has been doing that, which brings all sorts of recognizable gaming names to Atlanta for one scant weekend out of the whole year. Names like Richard Garriott, Chris Avalon, or Veronica Belmont. And I know that it's not PAX or anything, but having some actual tangible game programming in this city at all is pretty damn cool. And I admit, that's mostly because there aren't many game events whatsoever in Atlanta. Which is weird when you consider that up until 1998, we were hosting E3 itself. Nowadays, Dragon Con is pretty much the most we got. But on some terms, it's not like we're just playing catch up with other cities. With over 52,000 official visitors, it's a busier and more crowded convention than even a few of the Comic Cons out there. But their decision to add a fandom as big as video gaming happened only last year. So when I got an opportunity to talk to their media director before Khan, I made sure to ask a few questions about what might have been the cause behind their decision to start up the new track. Could you uh, very quickly tell us your name and what you do? Uh, my name is Dan Carroll. I'm the media relations director for Dragon Con. And what is Dragon Con? Uh, Dragon Con is the largest fan-run convention in the world that includes both gaming, film, comics, live music, and a film festival. So the thing that really got me into it last year was um, the opening of a video game track where you had um, Mike Caps, like the president of Epic, bring in all sorts of my own personal heroes being really into video games like Chris Avalone and Richard Garriott and stuff. And that really, really got me into this sort of thing. And I was wondering what um, sort of thought processes led up to the addition of the gaming track last year as opposed to earlier. Well, uh, DragonCon has six gaming tracks covering everything from card gaming to board gaming to campaign uh, to video and to digital gaming and uh, of course MMORPG. Uh, the gaming goes on 24 hours a day here at DragonCon. The move to the video gaming and digital gaming is just specifically a response to what we're getting from our fan base. We're asking for more sophisticated video gaming programming, uh, working with the gaming companies to bring in the type of guests that you just mentioned. From my point of view, as far as I, I can tell, there's more and more gaming happening and game creation happening here on the East Coast in North Carolina. Uh, I have friends who work for EA. Uh, Epic, obviously, has uh, got some centers Epic's over there. North Carolina. Uh, we've got uh, paper pencil gaming is, is very popular here in Atlanta, uh, and it's a large industry here in Atlanta, too. Atlanta has a handful of game studios of its own, but none as big as Epic. And Epic's decision to amplify the industry's presence at Dragon Con is likely because they're just a couple states away. But that still means that up until last year, people who liked video games and also had to put up with living in the South were just kind of shafted when it came to events like this. But now, they're not. Especially since Atlanta also had the Degra conference and the XYZ exhibit last month, things finally seem to be revving up. But I had to keep all that modesty in mind when titling this video the Dragon Con Gaming Report. This is a video game channel after all, and I have to stick to the topic of the channel, but not a lot of video game news happened here. That stuff happened at PAX. Dragon Con is more about giving fans a chance to directly interact with the people who made the games we already love, rather than passively watch them announce and present new games that we may or may not love later. So without further ado, let's see what actually happened this weekend. Guess what? Bunny Hop is legit enough to get press access to Dragon Con. So in order to fulfill our end of the bargain, we scheduled a whole bunch of interviews and cut together a bunch of panel highlights for you guys. Now, I'm going to be uploading the interviews every day for the rest of the week, but today's video is just going to be like the general news coverage of the event. I'm going to try to find, even though it's not a video game event, I'm going to try to find the most video game news that happens here while everyone else is reading about PAX. The most substantial interactions with game developers were, understandably, happening at the panels. 
All right, so uh, we'll start back over here on the end. And uh, if you can talk a little bit about uh, games you're finding really exciting right now, and just influences on you, whether they're video games or other media that influence your design. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, in the game space right now, I feel like we're kind of in an indie game golden age. It's just phenomenal, the development that's going on uh, in the indie space. I think a lot of it uh, comes from the technologies becoming a lot more accessible to people. I feel like just like YouTube democratized uh, filmmaking and TV and a lot of like blogging and stuff, I feel like uh, a lot of uh, uh, game dev tools are really getting better and making the barrier entry much lower. So yeah, I actually agree with uh, Seth a lot about the indie games. I've been playing a lot more indie game games recently than, uh, than big AAA games. So uh, for instance, have you guys played a Gone Home game? Yeah! Before that, I was a huge fan of uh, FTL, another But I, I sneer at the indie uh, revolution, and I can say that now because I'm not selling dimensions anymore. <laughs> FTL was kind of cool, but I would so much rather play Dishonored than FTL. And so FTL, I'm like, wow, this is cool. Okay, I can see how I could really play this again. It would go someplace, but oh my god, this level is amazing, and it's gorgeous, and the characters, and can't beat it. Uh, and so there's too many great AAA gaming experiences for me to have time for that. So it's solitaire on the iPad, and then right back to the seats <laughs> running. <laughs> Uh, what y'all felt like how it's going to change the way games are made or played now? You will never rip me away from my PC. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm sure, I'm sure it's possible. Right? Uh, I'm just going to point out that that Rise game, they totally misspelled the title, so obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, I definitely got my hands on the PS4 like the other day. It's, oh, so you it, already sold, oh, really? Do you like it a lot? Do you like the share button? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I'm a Luddite and don't really have a PC that works, so I'm a big console guy. Uh, <laughs> 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 So different, and like, I, I didn't know what they were going to go and do, but I wanted to find out. I was excited to go and try to go and play with that, and see if they could go and do it. Hi, everyone. This is Clementine, and I'm really happy to be here. And I'm really sad that we had to die, though. <laughs> Oh, 
sorry if it seems like I'm cutting that second one short. I actually have to make room for when I interview those same guys the next day. That's actually gonna be another video. And on that next day, interviewing was pretty much all we did. Our schedule conflicted with the panels, so we used our downtime to explore the rest of the place and check out what sort of gaming was going on elsewhere. And to no one's surprise, Dragon Con was full of games. Board games, card games, role-playing games. But where are the video games? Dragon Con is like a massive, mainstream-sized tidal wave of small, obscure-sized fandoms. In this environment, video games are not the default assumption for what you're referring to when you say the word game. There's a massive game room in one of the lower levels where you pay a one-time $5 fee to borrow from their huge stock of papery games. But video games are relegated to a smaller room upstairs where you pay by the hour for mostly competitive online games. For PCs, that pretty much means MOBAs. For consoles, it's just fighting games. It's awfully limiting compared to the setup they had in 2011, which resembled the economy downstairs. You borrowed from a huge collection, and you could cheaply blitz through a huge assortment of imported rare or retro games that you might never have another opportunity to play. And it's kind of sad that as the content of the video game track has evolved, the contents of the video game room have devolved. We couldn't even find an actual video game dealer across the whole con. Maybe we didn't look hard enough, but the dealer's rooms were massive this year. They took up entire buildings. It would have been easy to miss them in the crowd, but we still made two sweeps through them and didn't find anything. I don't know, maybe I'm just rambling at this point. Here's more panel highlights from Sunday and Monday. Uh, so I'm Chris Evelyn, uh, I'm creative director at City Entertainment. Uh, I don't really know why I'm on this panel, because Wasteland 2 and Torment Tides of Noon Era and Pudgy Eternity are all PC-based. <laughs> <laughs> the best console ever. <laughs> Doing an informal poll actually to kind of get like the civil war started in, in the room right now. Who is who is most excited about the Xbox One? All right, so that's okay. about 250. Okay. Who's most excited for the PS4? Wow. Who are you? Anybody? We are. We are. So PS4 wins. Okay, next one. So uh, I think one of the hard parts of the Xbox launch for them was to be so honest about the marketing, uh, sorry, the business model behind console games, right? Where they make their money is by selling new games. As a console developer, that's where I make my money. Um, you talked about, I guess, one of the earlier panels uh, that with a game like Saints Row, you need to make sure they keep that disc for a while so they don't return it used and it starts multiplying itself and tons and tons of people buy that game and play it but never give any money to the developer or to the console manufacturer. So Microsoft kind of took that head on and said, we're going to go like Steam. And everybody thought they were evil, a little evil or a lot evil. I'm trying to engage a lot evil. No, yes. No, a lot evil. Right. Um, but it's what Apple does with iTunes. It's what Valve does with Steam. And it's pretty inevitable that you guys aren't going to walk into a game store and buy a physical disc any more than you go buy CDs anymore. Uh, hello. Um, as um, I'm a European gamer, and I was very excited for uh, the new Xbox. And we saw the original launch, and it was hope. a part of the issue with the games not appearing in the initial uh, announcement. We were thinking, okay, great television things, but yeah, I'm going to pay more than um, uh, US customer because they are only changing the the dollar for an euro, and I'm not going to be, to be able to use half the things this machine is coming with, so I was not... You're not talking about the NFL ticket? You're not Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> the NFL? Yeah, well, I don't like, I don't even like sports, so yeah. But the thing is that, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Why, when Microsoft is dismissing their European or Japanese customers? Yeah, like, why? <laughs> This is a problem we have on, on the internet too, you know, with, with services like Netflix and Hulu and it, it kind of goes all across the board. It's just it's just a shitty problem that we haven't really figured out yet because there are so many laws and so many regulations in effect still that it makes it really complicated for 
for, for people to do business. So this business model issues. I mean, I was selling games in Russia for five dollars. Mm -hmm. One real tournament of three sold for five bucks because that's what fit the standard of living there and what you could actually sell it for. If you sold it for more than five dollars, everyone would steal it. And you sold it for less than five dollars, you were losing money. So you sold it for five dollars. But in Poland, very, very, very close to Russia, we were selling it for thirty-five dollars. So if we didn't reach a market, then guess what happens? Everyone goes over in a truck and buys 10,000 copies of it and brings them back over to Poland and we lose money. And it really sucks, but because the standard of living is so different worldwide, I would not say that the European standard of living was so much higher than the American standard of living that cutting out the dollar sign and putting a euro is fair. Not even close, uh, but that's part of where it comes from. Yo, Mike Caps. I really appreciate you bringing video games to my city. That's like super cool. I love it. But it really looks like you're playing the devil's advocate in these things. Maybe that's intentional. I don't know. What's next? The sole goal of this panel, the majority of it, is just so you guys can ask me questions about these projects. And that is the goal here. Because I love getting questions very much. And it lets you guys get back to doing the important things. Because I know at Dragon Con, drinking is very, very important. <laughs> Uh, so Eternity, uh, what is Eternity? Um, hey, guess what, by chance. Uh, so once upon a time, we sort of interplay, uh, there, was a kind of, there was a studio called Black Owl Studios interplay. We a lot of fantastic locations, like in Numbers Airships, like Baldur's Gate. Uh, we had the pleasure of working with Bioware and helping them publish the Baldur's Gate series. They did a fantastic job on it. Lots of cool uh, turn uh, pause and play combat. And that's what we wanted to try and do with Eternity. We're like, hey, well, you know, if we can actually do another game like this through Kickstarter and players really want to see it, let's try and make this happen. The only issue was Kickstarter was kind of the only avenue open to us at the time. We tried to pitch a game like that to a publisher. As soon as they heard to hear the words old school, isometric, windows focused, those are things that not doesn't make them a lot of money. So they kind of like turn off. They're like, well, it's really, it's really nice that you showed up. I'm really glad that you talked to us. There's the door. Don't let them get your ass on the way out. And uh, a lot of our effort, <laughs> that slide's going to make sense in a second. I'm not going to touch my finger. Um, and we're in the process of building out a lot of our vertical slice locations. <laughs> And when I say vertical slice, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with what that term means in the industry, that's like a sample of gameplay that sort of encompasses all the system mechanics and all the abilities the player character can use in the game and sort of tries them out to make sure they feel good and they work well because if you try and add 50 people or more to a project and you don't have that stuff figured out, it creates a lot of problems. If you don't know how Mario jumps, like if you don't know how high you can jump and how far you can jump, please don't make 50 levels in Super Mario Brothers <laughs> until you have that system mechanic laid out or you're gonna waste everybody's time. Um, so a part of the narrative box for Fallout is you wanna make sure that you're respecting the genre that you're writing for. And for Fallout, it's very much, hey, here's a world that people with a 1950s viewpoint imagine the future would be like. They drop a bunch of nuclear warheads on it. And then we develop an RPG system for creating characters in that world. Whether you know you're just a happy go lucky courier, whether you're a kind of a, a criminal finding your way around, uh, whether uh, you're a combat monster, whether you're a super scientific genius, a thiefy character, a guy who likes punching people out. All of these things <laughs> come right up to the box. For we're writing a narrative. For like, we want every single one of these characters to feel special during every quest that occurs in the game. We want to make sure that every single one of those characters has a viable way to solve that quest that's different than the others, and they all feel cool for having built their character that way. Otherwise, it was really shitty of us to give you the choice in the first place. <laughs> Whenever we try and develop more elements for our games, it's very, very important for us to make sure that the player is able to make some sort of change, and there's some selfish reason for a player to interact with whatever lore element we're designing. So if we have a faction in the game, we like to ask ourselves questions like, simple details like, hey, do you get new loot from, these, from this faction? Do you get a chance to join this faction? Can you take over this faction? Can you make this faction attack other factions? Things that actually drive the player experience forward and make you feel more empowered in the environment is an important question that we try to ask when actually developing uh, our RPGs. 
To be honest, this is the kind of programming that I'd like to see more of at DragonCon. It's an in-depth, substantial look at a very narrow topic, specifically one that was relevant for future projects. I don't want to imply that there wasn't more of that. There was a really cool Star Citizen preview that I'll be detailing in the corresponding interview video, but there just doesn't seem to be enough of that. Atlanta's long overdue for this sort of thing, and despite the overwhelming scale and massive attendances of DragonCon itself, the video games at DragonCon seem to be isolated and tucked away in a corner. And that's such a lost opportunity. It's a huge fandom with a lot of interest already there in the crowd, just look at how many video game cosplays you see. But even if they did expand the video game track, then DragonCon would still have to deal with the reputation of being the party con. And I don't mean to say that that's a bad thing. People like parties, and all the money and charity that DragonCon brings to this city means that it's some kind of force for good in the world. But the experience is hardly enriching on an intellectual or cultural level. It's like if you put Bourbon Street indoors and everyone was wearing some kind of nerdy costume. I guess this is why I felt a whole lot more comfortable in the professional setting of GDC rather than the party setting of DragonCon even though I was completely by myself on the other side of the continent. It's the familiar old Dirty South debauchery. There's just a thick coat of nerd culture painted on top of it. And unfortunately, if you're not literate in any aspect of nerd culture other than the video games, then that makes a lot of conversations in this crowd even more awkward. But it doesn't have to be that way. I want to see the video game track expand and incorporate more substantial and newsworthy events in them. And for that to happen, Atlanta's going to need more of a game scene. And I don't really understand why one hasn't sprung up already. The city is a transportation and media hub, the cost of living is cheap, there's a steady flow of qualified developers coming out of Georgia Tech, and there's even a nice tax incentive program for it. If just a few big names from out of the state came over and took advantage of those resources, then we could be at the cusp of a real East Coast alternative to PAX. It just seriously needs more manpower behind it. More companies than just Epic are going to need to get involved in the con to make that happen. But even as hard as DragonCon is trying right now, it's nowhere near being an alternative to PAX. It might be stumbling its way there. I can't really tell how much of an improvement this year's show is on last year's, but just the very creation of a video gaming track last year was an enormous step in the right direction. I'm just afraid that too much of it is teetering on the connections of the Caps couple and on no one else. Until then, that's not enough to elevate it from being the same old jubilant, rollicking, boisterous, and carefree party con. But don't get too discouraged. Those are just vague, general impressions of the whole event. Here's the plan. I got four more videos on the way, each one an interview feature with someone you may enjoy about a topic you may want to hear about. I plan on uploading one each day for the next four days, so keep your eyes on the channel to look forward to some of our most legit videos yet.